Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday town hall meeting. I want to uh, express my appreciation for you taking time uh, to learn about uh, local community issues. Uh, tonight we have a really great guest, UCSC Chancellor Cindy Larive, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about her in a, in a second and you'll get to see her. Uh, but I wanted to just share with you just a little bit of information. As most people know, this week, uh, the uh, CAL FIRE announced that the, the, the CZU Lightning Complex fire was 100% contained. They'll still be working up uh, in the fire area for many months, uh, putting out spot fires and just cleaning up uh, after the, the devastating fire that we've experienced here in Santa Cruz County. There's still a shelter open down at the fairgrounds. Uh, and right now the county has close to 2000 people in hotels. Some are, are fire evacuees and some are COVID evacuees, those who were uh, people experiencing homeless but medically vulnerable. Um, right now, there's still hundreds and hundreds of people that are in different shelters. Uh, the Board of Supervisors took action at our last meeting to speed up the process. And next week, we are having a special meeting to talk about what we need to know about uh, what we hope won't be the next disaster which is the, the debris flow uh, when it starts raining. When we've experienced a fire as, as hot as this one, it really destroys the soil and it, the soil loses its capacity to uh, accept water. And so we've been working with the USGS and our county geologists to map where we expect these debris flows to happen. Uh, because what we, as we saw down in Santa Barbara, you can outrun debris, debris flow. Uh, and we need to make sure that people aren't in the way and that, they, that they're safe uh, because when that rain comes, it only takes a small amount of rain to cause a, a huge damage uh, and a possible loss of life. We don't want to happen what happened down in Montecito. Uh, the other thing that I'll tell you is that the county health leadership is having a press conference tomorrow at 10 o'clock. You can watch it on Facebook Live. Um, they're going to be announcing where we are in the epidemic. Uh, there's been some news about our testing rate, um, a possible outbreak, and they will have all the latest information there. And I encourage you to tune in or watch later. Uh, it's uh, important for us not to forget that we have twin disasters right now in Santa Cruz County, and we're working hard to make sure that we're taking care of the needs of all the people affected by each of these disasters. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking uh, about uh, a storied local institution, UC Santa Cruz. And joining me tonight is uh, the chancellor, uh, Cindy Larive. Uh, I probably pronounced it wrong and uh, she'll let me know. Uh, she is the 11th chancellor of UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and uh, she started July 1st of last year. And that seems uh, so long ago. Um, in, in uh, COVID time. Uh, so some of you may have had a chance to, uh, to meet her before we weren't allowed to go out and about, uh, but I really am glad she's able to join us tonight. She came from UC Riverside. She's an accomplished scientist um, and she prefers that I call her Cindy. So uh, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just uh, uh, honoring the wishes of our guests. So hello, Cindy, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, John. It's great to see you and, and all of the folks who have joined us online. Yeah, and uh, I'm, just to uh, be clear, I'm a UCSC alum. Uh, I graduated in 1988 at a Merrill College with a politics degree, and that was the best part of my higher education, that is for sure. Um, you know, uh, Cindy, I thought it might be helpful uh, because be, because this your your first year has been interrupted by COVID, to just uh, tell a little bit about your background. Who are you, where you come from, and how did you end up here in Santa Cruz? Oh, well, thank you, John. Well, first, let me just say how happy I am to be in Santa Cruz, in Santa Cruz County, and at the University of California, Santa Cruz. What a great place and what a great community. I, I'm originally from a place that some of you may have heard of. It's Deadwood, South Dakota. And so Deadwood is a little town in the Black Hills. Um, and there was an HBO series about it um, that um, was actually pretty historically correct in the first few episodes anyway. 
And so I grew up there um, in a, my dad worked for the home state gold mine. He wasn't a miner. He worked in a foundry there. And, um, and uh, you know, my, my parents were working class uh, folks. We didn't have a lot of money, but uh, we did fine. And, and uh, my dad actually um, had a tough upbringing during the depression and he never learned to read. And so my folks wanted something better for me, and I was lucky enough to get to go to the university. Uh, so I went to South Dakota State University, which is about as far as you can get away from Deadwood and still be in South Dakota. So, you know, uh, but I got a scholarship to go there. And then, um, and then I worked for a while, uh, have two daughters, and then uh, we ended up moving to Southern California. Uh, and I went to graduate school at UC Riverside. And after that, went to the University of Kansas, then back to Riverside, and then eventually became an administrator and was lucky enough to get to be the chancellor at UC Santa Cruz. But that background of mine uh, makes me really committed to student success and student success for all students. And so at UC Santa Cruz, we were just named by US News and World Report number four in the nation for our contributions to social mobility, which means accepting low income first generation students and helping them get through to graduation. So we're really proud of that. Yes, congratulations. I know that's always been an important part and when we look at the makeup of uh, incoming classes, it's clearly a priority um, on the admissions side as well and uh, has yielded amazing students. Yes. Um, I just wanna remind people that they can ask questions using the Q&A function and we'll, we'll get a chance to uh, to answer them, I'm going to ask a couple more questions. You know, tonight we're here talking about COVID and testing and our partnership together. Um, you know, UC Santa Cruz is a research institution. Um, how do you get involved? You're not a medical school. You're one of the, the UCs that doesn't have a medical school, but here you are uh, testing for COVID. How did that happen? Well, it happened in a very um, organic way. Uh, it was clear to our faculty uh, and to the university that testing was going to be a big problem as the pandemic grew. And uh, we have faculty who have expertise in RNA, in viruses, uh, in vaccines, and um, they came together to say, you know, we could do this. We could create a testing lab. An important component of a testing lab, though, is you also need someone who is certified as someone who is a, a clinical lab uh, designation. And so Elena Vasca, who is in our Treehouse Cancer Project, which, which studies the genomes of pediatric cancers, has that certification. And so with Elena's help, uh, uh, we could pull together a testing um, facility and get it certified by the FDA. And sure. so that certification came about in May. At that time, we were just doing, you know, a handful of tests a day. We've scaled that up now to doing about 400 tests uh, a day, and we're going to uh, ramp that up even further. But uh, we, the county has been so supportive in that efforts to scale up. We're really appreciated for that appreciative for that. The county helped us with some of the important equipment that we need. And uh, the Santa Cruz Community Foundation has helped uh, to provide financial support for testing of, of individuals at Salud Per La Gente and also in the Santa Cruz Health Center. So um, I, it's been a real success story, I think, for us yeah. and for the community. Yeah, I think what's uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is you're not using the off-the-shelf tests you, that you've created your own test and you're 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 making things with 3D printers and everything. That's right. It was really wise decision of the faculty to do it in that way. So many uh, commercial testing or even testing labs in a hospital use a, a, a platform that's sold by a vendor and it's a kit basically. Sure. And then with the need to ramp up testing across the country, those supplies have come in, in really short, short uh, availability. Sure. And since we're starting everything, it's like baking cookies from scratch instead of buying the ones in the tube, right? So uh, we, we use the raw reagents and it gives us a lot more flexibility and, and it's really let us avoid some bottlenecks. So our tests, uh, we're able to return results within about 48 hours, sometimes within 24 hours. Wow. 
Yeah, it's, it's critical. I mean, one of the things that we've learned in this uh, pandemic is we got to take care of ourselves uh, because the resources out there are limited. And uh, by having the university have a different kind of test that doesn't count on the, on the same things that everybody else is doing, uh, that, uh, that it means that we won't have to be in competition in the same way that we were at the beginning part of this pandemic and not having enough resources you say that you're doing 400 tests today. So is, is there a testing site on campus? Um, is it open to the public or is it the test from the two clinics? It's the test from the clinics. It's, uh, it's our own tests as well. So UC Santa Cruz students and staff can, um, can come to our health center to be tested, but we're not able to do testing for, for others. We ask that they go through the, uh, the, the, their provider we don't we we're not able to do uh, billing for for tests so we, we can't really uh, do uh, do tests for hospitals and things like that but we're able to help with uh, um, those the the patients or the people who come into the Santa Cruz Community uh, Foundation um, uh, the 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 Santa Cruz Health Center or the Salud per la gente also we're doing some uh, testing for first responders within the community. So if you can imagine if a police officer or a fire person gets uh, exposed, then, then they have to isolate. And sometimes it can take up, up to a week or two to get your results back. Uh, that, that really limits our ability to help our first responders doing the good work we need them to do. Yeah, uh, it's uh, critically important. And I know that, that you've also done some testing, I think, for our county jail, which is one of the places that we're keeping a very close eye on, as we are with all of the facilities where people are in one place. It's a, that could be, we, as we've seen across the country, that's very deadly. And uh, we, uh, uh, regular testing really makes a big difference to make sure you can manage and contain uh, the spread of the virus. Um, so in, if this was a normal year, uh, the students would all be returning uh, to campus next week. Um, how many students are expected and, and what's the idea about testing uh, for all them? Oh yeah, great, great question. Well, let me first talk about our plans for the fall quarter. So we decided in early June that our fall quarter would be almost entirely remote. At that point, we had planned to offer 20 in-person classes. Uh, we've since scaled even that back. We now have, I think, six classes running in person. It's like 50 students. And so um, the, that decision was made um, based on the input of about 200 people, uh, including uh, some folks who might be, uh, you know, well known to this, to this, to this audience, uh, Marm Kilpatrick and others on our campus who really said, you know, this, we should, we should not be uh, thinking we're going to have large numbers of in-person students in in-person sure. classes. The advantage of that too is that that then means students don't have to be here in Santa Cruz to, uh, to attend class. So everything's offered remotely. And uh, we, we were planning to have about 2,000 students in housing on campus. Normally we would have 8,500 to 9,000 students in residence. And even after the fire, we, we contacted those students and uh, individually and said, you know, things in Santa Cruz are pretty tough right now. Uh, we suggest that if you can stay at home, that you do. So we're down to now about a thousand students who'll be living on wow. campus. Um, but, but the enrollments will be very similar to last year. It's just that people won't be here locally. So our plans for testing is, uh, you know, of course, we will do um, a testing of anybody who has symptoms on the campus. All the students with symptoms would, of course, uh, be asked to be tested. But when students first arrive, they'll all be tested. They'll be asked to quarantine themselves, to isolate themselves for seven days. They'll be tested a second time. Uh, what we've watched across the country is that that's very important. Sure. And we plan to test everybody who comes to campus, whether those are the students living on campus, uh, students who might be working in a lab, faculty or staff who come to campus, everyone to be tested twice a week. And we'll be doing that as asymptomatic testing. So, so how kind of screening of everybody on campus. I think that's important for us to do because we know that Many people can, 
can be um, carriers of COVID and not have any symptoms, but yet infect sure. others. Yeah, and I want to remind people you can ask questions by using the Q and A function, and uh, we'll we'll get to your questions. I just want to ask you. Uh, we saw down in San Diego, university opens up, uh, hundreds of cases happen. We've mm -hmm. seen this across the country. There's some places that have worked well, and some that where where we've seen outbreaks. What have you gleaned from that experience? Have you talked with your peers, and mm -hmm. uh, how's that influencing what happens on at UC Santa Cruz? Well, well, it has it hasn't actually influenced us very much because we were so conservative from the start. But uh, we do keep in regular contact with folks. Big difference there is at San Diego State University, they had quite a few in-person courses, and they have a lot of students um, living in the community. Um, on campus, but also off campus. Um, and uh, that, uh, that mix of students, as we've seen across, across the country, it's sometimes not what happens on campus that's the problem. It's what happens out in the, in the, the fraternities or sure. sororities yeah. or housing. We've been messaging to our students, uh, uh, and uh, we've got a set of slug strong uh, principles that we want everybody to abide by. I, I think that we'll have good tabs on on what happens here in, in on campus, and we also have been communicating directly with the the students who are in Santa Cruz. Uh, sure. Many of those are graduate students, which I think are a lower risk uh, than than, for example, freshmen or undergraduate students, and just in terms of their level of of understanding of of the disease and and how to prevent spread, but. Uh, we're doing everything we can to uh, to talk to folks about um, you know how to, how to keep themselves and their communities safe, and uh, the testing is going to be really important. So we've set aside lots of housing on campus to use as quarantine space, the ability to test and identify uh, the folks who are infected quickly is important, and then uh, to also uh, in, uh, support students as, as they might quarantine. So I think we're in good shape good shape with that. I heard, uh, but I haven't seen it yet, that Sammy the Slug, our mascot, um, he, he has been outfitted with a mask made by our art department. And there All are right. videos and pictures of Sammy today on campus. So, uh, you know, I think there's just lots of ways for us to help say, you know, wearing the mask, that's the right thing to do. And I hope all your listeners uh, wear a mask when they leave the house. That's so important. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's it's one of the things, even the head of the CDC said it's probably more effective than the vaccine yes. uh, is to wear masks. And, uh, you know, with the, the County Board of Supervisors is one of the few jurisdictions that's actually still holding in-person meetings. Oh. And the only thing we ask is that people wear a mask, but we still get a pushback from some. Um, they, they generally come around, but uh, it's, it's amazing that we're fighting over this science that's uh, at least 100 years old. Um, uh, I want to remind people just to, they can ask questions, but I just had a couple more, uh, Cindy, if you're okay. Sure. The, um, uh, you, so you've made decisions and been fairly conservative about, uh, about this fall. I saw that, uh, you know, the, 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 the sister system um, in CSU has already made a decision about what's going to happen in the spring. Mm -hmm. Has UC or UC Santa Cruz made uh, any decisions about the, uh, the win I guess it would be the winter quarter. Right. We haven't announced uh, a decision yet, and that will be coming soon. Um, you know, our classes haven't started yet for fall. Yeah. But I think that it, I think it's most likely that for winter quarter, it will be more or less what we have in the fall quarter. It will be mostly sure. remote. Whether there might be six classes or 20 classes, you know, it'll be small numbers of students in person. Um, whether or not we can increase our housing a little bit to accommodate some of the students who intended to live on campus this fall or not, I will have to wait and see. Uh, we're really watching what happens at other campuses within the sure. UC system and, and elsewhere. And also depends a little bit on the level of, of uh, positivity of, of the level of infection uh, in the region and in the sure. state, right? Because our students come from across the state, that, that's an important aspect. So we'll be watching that. I think winter will be probably pretty similar to fall. When we get the vaccine and how quickly the vaccine is distributed, it's too soon to say whether things will be a little bit looser in the spring. I don't expect this is going to be like a light switch. I don't think it's going to be all of a sudden we have a vaccine and we're back to the way we were before. 
but I think it's going to be more like a dimmer switch will gradually get looser. And, sure. and so hopefully by fall 2021, we'll be back to something more normal. Yeah, well, it's uh, we're trying to prepare people for the long race uh, instead of the sprint because it's going to take a while, even with a, an amazing vaccine, just to even get it out and get to people. Um, yeah. There's a couple, I have lots of questions for you, Cindy, but there were a couple questions that's come in. Uh, okay. One is technical, and so if you don't know it, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori is asking, is the UCSC test a PCR test? Yeah. And if so what the CT value is being used? Yeah, so um, uh, I know a little bit. I'm an analytical chemist by tra training, so the testing part is is we're pretty good. So it is a it is a it is an RNA test, and so uh, but I don't know what the CT value is. But uh, uh, it uh, it's our test is actually more sensitive, and has a fewer um, false false positives and false negatives than the the sort of kit based tests. And a lot of that has to do with sample preparation, but it also has to do with a, a variety of things that we can fine tune. So it's, it's, a really, uh, it's a really high quality test. Yeah, that, that's what I've heard from our health staff is that this test will be even better than the tests that are commonly out there. So again, nice to see uh, UCSC at the front of the line uh, on that. Uh, another question uh, came in, uh, do you have any idea how many students are still living in town and taking classes this way? Yeah, we have, a, we have an idea that, um, and we're trying to get a, an exact, we want to know everybody uh, who is here, and not just for the numbers, but also so we can support them in, in case they become ill or in case there are any problems. And so right now, that number I'm told is total between four and 5,000. That includes the 1,000 students or so living on campus. And, and so probably around 1,500 of that number are uh, graduate students. Okay. And is the library open? I mean, will, will the library be open for people? The, li the library is not open and, and, and will not be open, but they're putting great materials online. Great. And so um, the library has, um, has been very far out uh, ahead of this and has been working uh, to get all kinds of materials available online. And so I think, you know, that's really terrific because that also then uh, makes it a lot easier for folks to get access to materials. Not only you don't have to worry about going to the library and having human contact with somebody, but also the librarians don't have to worry about what might come in on a book, for example. How do you disinfect a book? I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, probably somebody knows, but I don't know. So, uh, so the library services are open, but they're not open uh, for, for people. I worked in the library when I was when I was a student on campus, and it's one of my favorite places on campus. There's no doubt about it. I love um, the, libraries. Um, we we got a question asking about the, given that there's still f much fewer students coming to campus. Has there been any thought into providing housing for some of the people displaced from the fires, as part of our twin disaster? You know, that we yeah. Have? Yeah, so I'm glad to talk about that. Right now, I don't have a, a real firm answer, but I can tell you what we're thinking about. So one thing to know is that even though we have many fewer students on campus, the distribution of those students is not normal. So normally we have rooms with two or three, sometimes four students in a larger room. Sure. Right now, we're because of COVID, we only have one student per room, and we have to put aside quite a bit of space for quarantine. And so just in case we do have an outbreak, we have somewhere to house people. We are exploring uh, whether or not we can use some uh, parts of the housing uh, to, to uh, have um, kind of medium term uh, housing for folks who might be displaced from the fire. We're exploring whether or not we can do that. Maybe first with our own staff and faculty who might be displaced and then with the, with the community. I know housing is such a need right now Sure. So we're trying to uh, understand that, uh, whether or not that's possible and what that might look like. Great. Well, I appreciate that information. Uh, a question comes in from Stephen about why were those particular six classes chosen to be taught in person? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we, um, we when we first in June were looking at what classes might be taught in person, we got 
we got quite a few. We had started with maybe 50 and then we kind of pushed on people. Does it really have to be in person? So these are classes that are mostly upper division classes that are requirements for majors. And they are classes that are just really not possible to do in the remote format. There are things like um, in, uh, chemistry, some chemistry labs, some, sure. some field work, some art studios. And so, um, and those classes might be different ones next quarter, but they're really cases where uh, it's just not possible to duplicate it. And it's an important requirement for graduation. Um, uh, great, you know, the, the, I've always, when I was worked up on campus, uh, I worked at UC Santa Cruz before, yeah. uh, for seven and a half years before I became a county supervisor. And I was always impressed by the work family balance policies that the university had. How many people are are on campus or working remotely? I mean, do you have any sense about that? Yeah, so almost everybody is working remotely, except if they need to be on campus to help support the functions of the campus or to support, uh, do their research. So, you know, as a chemist, if I still had a lab, I would be on campus because my lab would be there. But it's it's folks working in facilities, I don't know the exact number. I think it's probably in about the 500 people on a given day kind of number. Uh, it's uh, so it's much fewer than normal. And uh, um, if you if I come to campus, I occasionally get to get to go to campus. I we have a symptom checking form that we have to complete, and we have to be authorized to go on campus. Uh, everybody has to wear a mask, and sure. uh, we're trying hard to keep that keep everybody on campus you know, who, who's there to do their, their work safe. We've also done a lot of work just within the buildings where people are to say, um, this stairway goes up, this stairway goes down, uh, to make sure that, uh, um, that uh, there's no, uh, as little of contact between people in the hallways and restrooms and things as possible. Uh, so Johanna uh, asked a really important question about uh, are there plans to circumvent the billing issues so we can ramp up your ability uh, to serve the community with rapid test results? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know that 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 that's um, something that we're able to do directly. Um, it's uh, insurance billing turns out to be a really complicated thing. And you can hire, um, I, we lo I looked into this a little bit, we did, um, you can like get a service that does that for you and they charge money. We're doing our tests at cost. Sure. We're not trying to make any money uh, uh, on it. And so that, that also, you know, kind of makes it harder for us to be able to, to do that. So the county and the, uh, the Santa Cruz Community Foundation has been really helpful in, in helping us uh, being able to manage uh, those aspects of the testing. Another thing to know though is that, you know, UC Santa Cruz and our faculty, staff, and students, we are the community. We're the community too. And so as we yeah. can take on the responsibility for ourselves, that also frees up a lot of uh, availability of testing and other kinds of resources in the community. Yeah, no, I, I, th I think it's fantastic. And I know we've been talking about this at the county about the ways in which we can deal with the billing issues. It's, you know, first you have to worry about, can you get the test? Then you have to worry about where you have to get the equipment and um, running into some of these insurance issues. Um, it t gives you an idea of how complicated insurance billing is when a, a, a county and a university have to wrestle with uh, how to get it done uh, well so we can make sure that these tests are available. I'm confident though that as once the, the equipment is all installed and ready to go and the staffing is, is there, that will we, we will have figured out the, um, the billing questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, someone asked here, are there any plans to open the recreational facilities like the pool or the gym? No, I, I, I don't think we're planning to open the pool or the gym anytime soon. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a worry for us, I think. Um, it, it we'll have to watch the, you know, where Santa Cruz is in, in the governor's, um, roadmap to, to COVID. I certainly wouldn't want to do that right now. I, I want to keep things um, uh, really um, as little um, possibilities for spread, especially as we're starting the quarter. Sure. I think we can evaluate those, those kinds of issues, you know, again, in a month or so, see where we are, see what the county infection rate is, how things are going at UC Santa Cruz. And 
and do that. Um, the campus, you know, is, I do see a lot of people up walking, riding their bikes on the weekends. And so uh, what I've been able to, to read, John, and maybe you too, is that outdoor activities are, are, seem to be much safer than being indoors. So, you know, um, I try and walk every day. And, and I think that that kind of uh, exercise is probably uh, going to be be the way that uh, we think about things for a while. Well, we definitely the, 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 it's definitely a beautiful campus to walk around. So that that uh, is a, a great benefit uh, to have. And I know that we wrestle with this at the county in terms of our facilities. The playgrounds aren't open. We've opened our pool, but you have to sign up for lap swim. It's it's oh. it's much more regimented. The swim teams aren't there. The just open swims uh, aren't there. And so it's 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 tough to figure out what's the best way to deal with it. Um, so a uh, question comes in about uh, since most since you're doing mostly remote learning, mm -hmm. how does it affect the uh, students who qualify for work study jobs? Mm -hmm. And um, how is that? Is there another way for them to earn money towards their education? Yes, for many students, that's true. We've been uh, pretty creative. So. Uh, our career center has a lot of uh, work and internships that uh, students can do remotely. Um, one example of what what uh, what we've done is our uh, IT uh, department. Um, normally, they would staff a lot of computer labs, and they would use students to staff those labs. There's one in the library. They're all over campus. Now we can't have those staffed anymore. But they hired the students to be a Zoom, Zoom, a Zoom core. So the faculty member has a student assigned to them, who's an IT pretty, pretty, you know, a guru. Some of yeah. these students are just amazing, aren't they? And they can help the professor, help the students manage any Zoom problems that come up. And so that's been one way that we've been able to have students involved. We also need even more than when we're in person, uh, people who are peer mentors and tutors because you know it's, it doesn't scale as well, right? On on the on the on the, sure. on the virtual world, but also we need you know the the community, uh, that human contact. That's so important for all of us, and especially for our students who who are feeling disconnected and and and. Uh, a really great way to be able to support them so we're trying to have those kinds of opportunities for work study students and for others sure so here's a question that i know that we've faced very uh, uh we've felt very deeply at the county is how has COVID affected the financing of, or finances of the the, the campus uh we we've had to make some very difficult choices uh we had some reserves which have been helpful but we made 12 million dollars worth of cuts just about a month ago to our budget. Yeah, well, so um, at UC Santa Cruz, I, I think I can explain it as we sort of have two budgets. We have our core budget that supports the building, supports all the people like me who work in, in administration or in teaching or in research and services. And that budget, it really comes from our tuition and fees paid for by students, by state support, and then a few other things. Um, looks like our enrollments are going to be more or less like what they were last year. So that's good for, for uh, both for our students, uh, because we know that when students stop out, they're not as likely to come back. And, and uh, but we got about a $21 million state cut uh, from that part of the budget. But I think we've also been very conservative about hiring. Uh, we can't travel, so we save money there, uh, not so much entertainment. And so I'm hoping we can kind of bridge that on, on one-time funds. Our auxiliaries also have a, a budget and auxiliaries are units like, like housing, dining, parking, the Arboretum, the Seymour Center, the bookstore, there are units that um, they don't receive state funding or direct funding from tuition, but they, they sort of might run like a business. And there the budget gap is much larger. I don't know exactly what it'll be, but likely $100 million. Wow. Because we, you know, our house, we reduced our housing from 9,000 students to 1,000. Uh, that means we don't have as many students in the, in the dining hall. And so We've been trying very hard to limit um, limit layoffs, and so I'm I'm we're doing our best there. It's hard when people's work goes away, but um, 
we're, we're, we're doing our best. I know uh, I was walking a precinct just the other day and I ran into a, a cafeteria employee, you know, and the food service employee who was very grateful uh, to still be working, uh, had worked up there many years and, um, and felt like it was a safe place to work and everything and that people still need to eat when they were up there. So uh, it's it worked out for everybody. Um, it's, so have you had to do uh, any layoffs or, or are they still under contemplation? Yeah, well, um, we, we often have temporary layoffs in the summer because the, the amount of people on campus. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know that I, I know for sure, but I, I, we haven't had to so far, I would say. I wanted to give a shout out to the county because one of the reasons our dining service has been doing so well is uh, we got a contract from the county uh, to help um, to provide food to to individuals who are in shelters. That that was a thousand meals a day before the fire, three thousand meals a day after the fire, and uh, uh, the Seaside Company let us use their kitchen while we were evacuated. We were in the Coconut Grove, uh, yeah. making up meals there, and so that that's been great for the community. It's also helped us keep keep our dining workers employed. So. So those are ways in which um, you know the the good the good sort of goes around and and uh, can help can help so many in that way. Yeah, well, it's been really helpful to have that food service uh, for the shelters. Uh, just so people know, we have eleven shelters uh, with six hundred people in them um, still, and so uh, it becomes really important to be able to have food service uh, available. Um, so just I want to switch gears a little bit. The important UCSC community issue is the growth plans for the university. And, um, you know, you would, uh, the university had started an LRDP update uh, process uh, proposing growth uh, to the university. Has any of that changed as a result of the pandemic? Well, uh, I would say on the one hand, not really, but I, I'd just like to talk to that a little bit, if that's okay. It's sure. not really a growth plan. So a, a long range development plan is a plan that, it, that it, the university or a government agency, somebody does that says that if this happened, what would be the environmental impacts and how would we mitigate them? And so the number in th that, that the university selected um, as part of that long range planning process was 28,000 students in 2040 that where that number came from was by looking at how we'd grown in the last 20 years and saying, you got to pick a number, right? So that, that would be a reasonable target to do the environmental impact analysis for. It's not a target though, for us to think about, we have to grow to this number. And I was saying, even after I first came here, uh, you know, the students who will be fresh freshmen at UC Santa Cruz in 2040 have not yet been born. We don't know what they will want and what higher education will look like in 2040. That's even more relevant today. We've just put the whole university online. We don't want to be an online university. We want it because the in-person experience is so important. But I don't see us, you know, universities are not going to be the same after COVID. Right? We've learned how to be effective and doing things like remote instruction, uh, uh, online learning. And so uh, there's things like uh, your chemistry lab or a sculpture studio that you really need to be in person for. But so how many, you know, what the enrollment level is uh, in 2040 might, might be something in that range. That doesn't necessarily mean that there would be that many people on the campus, right? And, and so uh, I think that that's an important thing to bear in mind. What, it, what, what the LRDB process really is is a way to think about mitigating environmental impacts and to planning for if you were going to build a building, where would it go? Yeah, and I think that the reason why people think about it that way is in past experience, you said every time a target has been set, a target has been met. So um, Understand. Uh, if the future looks anything like the past, that's why, that's why we think about it that way. Uh, of course, I understand. Yeah. Um, so uh, getting back to other issues, uh, uh, can you speak to any new ways that the campus is working to, to address the mental health needs of students, given these very unusual times of social distancing, remote learning? I know it's a big issue. Oh, yeah. Well, mental health is an issue even without, without 
the, these times, right? And, and I think we've seen that the added stresses of, of COVID, uh, it's beyond remote learning, right? It's people whose financial situation has changed, just their, um, you know, as more people get COVID, uh, more of us are gonna be impacted in that in our families. And so uh, we, we have uh, increased the number of counselors we have available. And we're using uh, tele, telehealth, uh, and that seems to work very well for counseling. Importantly, too, we've not just increased the number of counselors available, but we've also increased the diversity of counselors available so that students can, can feel comfortable culturally talking to, to someone for, for, for that, um, that purpose. Uh, we're, we're trying our best to support students both through the normal uh, counseling uh, and psychological uh, supports, but also through mentorship and outreach through our resource centers and uh, many of those in student affairs and, uh, and students reaching out to other students. So this issue of mental health is important for our whole community and um, all of us need to, to, uh, to get help when we need it. Sure, for sure. No, it's, a, it's important and we're all thinking about this as we are less connected. We know that uh, isolation does, does not help uh, with anybody's mental health. And so trying to figure out how do we keep connected becomes critically important. I wanna return back to COVID for a moment and the, uh, the, the county partnership with the university has been in the purchase of equipment and, um, and uh, other elements of that. And do you have a sense of where that is in terms of uh, have that increased capacity in terms of timing? Yeah, I can tell you that. I, I was just looking here. You know, I think I actually made a mistake and I want to correct that, John. I think I said we're doing 400 tests a day. I think right now it's 400 tests a week. Okay. And so um, that's a big difference, right? <laughs> but uh, um, we are ramping that up and we were on track to, to be ramped up to, to uh, you know, a much higher number of tests a week in, in, in well over a thousand uh, until the fire came. And then with the fire, sure. we had to evacuate. The equipment that we'd ordered hadn't yet been delivered. And so then it got put into a shipping container and so uh, once we got able to get back on campus, uh, we located equipment, we've now got it on campus, and then we had to arrange with the, the, the company, which is Agilent Technologies, to come and do the installation. That's now, uh, that we're now beyond that. And so uh, now I, I think we expect that by, by um, middle of October, we're gonna be up to doing about, uh, you know, 1500, probably 12 to 1500 tests a week. So, so that's the time scale that we're looking at. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's, uh, we have tried to increase our testing capacity all the time. In addition to the university, we've bought equipment uh, for Sutter mm -hmm. and Watsonville Hospital, uh, new equipment obviously for the county. Um, and it, as, it's interesting, as we've uh, built some capacity, we've also seen uh, a slight decrease in the number of people coming in to get tested. Mm -hmm. And right now, you can get tested and the turnaround is pretty quick at all locations, including ones in the past that have been slow. Right. Uh, and we know that as we open things up, as, 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 our, as our rates um, uh, plateau or hopefully go down, that we get to open more things up and uh, it's going to be critically important for people to get tested. And I encourage people to go to the santacruzhealth.org slash coronavirus uh, and, and click the recovery tab and you can find all the testing sites in uh, Santa Cruz, the ones that are affiliated with the county, um, as well as ones that are federally funded like the Westside Pharmacy, mm -hmm. CVS Pharmacies are also now doing testing. And the turnaround is, is, is pretty quick with those. Uh, but if we're gonna, the more and more we open, the more and more testing we're gonna need to do. And it becomes uh, uh, super important for people if they've been exposed or think they've been exposed to actually go get their testing. That's right. You know, and it's not, it's, not, it's not painful. I did it. Uh, it's not bad at all to do. And so I've, you know, I think it uh, should be a low barrier. Yeah, exactly. And the work that you're doing with the health center, the Santa Cruz Community Health Center, and for people who don't think about it that way, that, that's the Women's Health Center and the East Cliff Family Health Center. 
um, together. They're called the Santa Cruz uh, uh, Community Health Centers. Uh, you know, the, it's it's uh, it's um, it's good that we have the university in town that has the uh, someone who could get the certification that has the equipment. Um, you have a number of other folks who uh, are. Are, are working on the area of infectious disease. We've had Marm Kilpatrick um, uh, on the town hall uh, talking about his work uh, and how are they involved? And you probably have other researchers who are involved with this. Yeah, we have many researchers involved. And so, you know, Marm, Marm studies uh, it, the way disease is transmitted. And, and before COVID, he wasn't really working on people, but it, it turns out it can work and in, 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 that kind of work translates very easily. Um, so uh, we have uh, Rebecca Dubois, who is in is working on vaccine research and antigen testing, uh, and a number of other folks who are also thinking about uh, ways uh, that we could uh, pr develop potential treatments for COVID as well. I just want to say, though, you know, COVID's going to be with us for a while, but we're going to see, you know, we have the potential to see new pandemics in the future. We always know that there could be another H1N1 flu, a ver really virulent strain of the flu. Uh, and, and so it's that while the test is specific for COVID, the strategies, the equipment, the, the ability to, to really mount the, the, this kind of an effort could easily be adapted for another kind of virus. So I think that it's like you build your muscle, right? And then, then you, you'll keep that. So I, I think that's a real powerful thing. The, the, the other thing is that Elena Vasca, who's helping to lead this effort, you know, her goal is to also be able to have genomics testing for pediatric cancers and to be able to take human really samples from 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 that might come from from children and be able to do the genomics for 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 rare tumors i mean that that could be so important right and right. so that there, there's other ways that this uh the technology and the expertise and the people can be used for the greater good yeah well i appreciate that we're getting to take advantage of that uh, of that um expert base that, that we have in the university here in our uh, own community, because I know Marm has uh, worked with our Economic Recovery Council. Um, he's, he's been out in public, and I know Rebecca is going to be out in public uh, talking about these issues. These are really critical, and I had the uh, good fortune of serving on a board with uh, Larry Brilliant, a uh, great doctor, part of the team that eradicated smallpox, and in, in the early 2000s, he was telling me about, you know, the, the pandemic that we have to worry about. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of his what he envisioned is happening. And so we're, this, the globalized world uh, affects us in lots of different ways. But one of it is that a disease can move pretty quickly uh, right. th through a community. Uh, I, uh, related to that is um, we were talking before uh, this meeting started today that we also have experts to help us with the fire related issues. And, you know, who's up on campus? that can help us uh, think about what's happening in our community and with, with our environment um, uh, with, the, with the recovering from the fire? Yes, that's a great, great question. Uh, we have a number of people on campus who, who have expertise related to that. Uh, there's uh, folks who are working with uh, drones to try and be able to survey burned areas. And I learned from Gage Dayton, who is the director of our natural reserves, that there will be an effort to monitor the nine natural UC natural reserves that have been burned by fire so far this year and to follow how the, the animals and plants recover over time. That should be really helpful and help us really understand how, how forests regenerate and what we can do. As you mentioned, uh, John, uh, debris flows, uh, flooding, uh, landslides that could come from rain events are going to be really important. We know that the soil becomes uh, as you said, it really gets changed dramatically over such a hot fire. It becomes sort of hydrophobic and the water really gets sort of repelled by, by the soil instead of being soaked up by it. And uh, you know, Andy Fisher and other folks in our, our earth, earth sciences uh, and environmental sciences are, are really good at thinking not only about, um, about what happens in the ecosystem, but also what happens with our groundwater hydrology. Sure. Uh, 
it's also going to be important because water is a scarce resource in our region, right? Drinking right. water. And so um, trying to understand how hydrology might be affected, uh, even if we're able to mitigate any, any debris flows. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot that we're going to have to work on as our, our environment has changed with this fire. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, that, um, that when we're talking about housing, about the impact on uh, staff and faculty, uh, we all have friends up in Bonnie Doon. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a terrible tragedy, the, the number of homes there uh, and all friends up in the San Lorenzo Valley. Do you have any sense of the impact on the UC Santa Cruz family? Yeah, actually, uh, we we did a we we developed a, f a couple forms and we did outreach. We uh, we we identified faculty, staff, and students who were um, who were homeless um, initially, but maybe because they were evacuated, uh, but also and and we managed to house uh, our own faculty, staff, and students uh, to to uh, to a large degree, so they didn't impact the shelters. But then, uh, um, sadly, to, to learn whose homes have been burned or who have been damaged, we, we uh, did some fundraising to help support faculty, oh. staff, and students who, who had difficulty because of who were impacted in that way by the fires. And of course, you know, my heart just goes out to everybody. That's such a, such a difficult, difficult thing um, to lose your home to fire. And, um, and so, um, We've been trying to support support our community the best we can, um, and also um, uh, to uh, to do what we can to help to help the greater community. Well, uh, you know, I just want to express my appreciation to you and the university for the partnership with the university. I mean, with the county, uh, but uh, you know, these are tough times to be leaders, and uh, it's uh, you've arrived at a at a, a weird confluence of COVID, fires, um, our every decade uh, the, the, the debate about growth at UC Santa Cruz, they, they've, they, they filled your plate pretty quickly uh, here. And I appreciate your willingness to come on and talk with community members uh, about important issues. And I think we have to have this kind of engagement in order to, to be successful. We, we, we will agree on way more than we disagree. Uh, but I just appreciate your openness and willingness to, to, uh, to engage the community. It really makes a difference. Oh, well, thank you, John. It's just my great pleasure. And, um, um, you know, we have such great people here. Um, I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this community. I want to uh, let people know that next week we're going to be doing a, t a special town hall with the uh, fire chiefs from Aptos, La Silva, and Central Fire, uh, as well as my colleague, Supervisor Zach Friend, to talk about uh, the possible consolidation of those two fire districts to form the largest fire district in Santa Cruz County. Uh, this is a project that I know I've been working on probably for four years. Uh, and it's, it was one of the things identified in a grand jury report recently. So there's going to be lots of good information. It's obviously a big shift. And I encourage people to tune in next Wednesday at six o'clock to hear from the fire chiefs directly. I want to thank uh, Cindy for being here uh, today. Uh, I look forward to uh, deepening this partnership around testing to meet the needs of our community. And uh, everybody wear a mask, wash your hands and stay six feet away. And uh, we can uh, figure out a way to, to open things up if, if necessary, but uh, stay healthy. So thank you for being here and look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon. Bye. Bye-bye.